Biopics may be based on true stories, but that doesn't mean they are true stories. Often, screenwriters and filmmakers have to juice up the tales they're telling, and sometimes they can end up a little taller than some might like. Here are the biggest lies biopics told you in the past decade. Bohemian Rhapsody primarily tells the story of Freddie Mercury, the charismatic, supernaturally voiced lead singer of Queen. It's natural that filmmakers wanted to place particular attention on the late, larger-than-life Mercury, but it was kind of a practical decision, too, since the history of Queen the band doesn't contain nearly as many dramatic moments as Bohemian Rhapsody may claim. The film suggests Queen formed after Mercury introduced himself to Brian May and Roger Taylor and gave them an impressive impromptu audition. I was born with four additional incisors. Most face in my mouth means more range. But when Mercury actually joined those guys, they were already his roommates. Then there's the matter of the movie suggesting Queen split up so Mercury could selfishly and arrogantly pursue a solo career. But Queen never broke up. Sure, they took a hiatus in 1982, but that was so all the band members could go off and record their own stuff. By 1984, they'd released the album The Works and toured throughout 1984 and 1985 to promote it. That emotional sequence where the band let bygones be bygones to reunite for a triumphant appearance at Live Aid in the summer of 1985? For them, that was just another day at the office. Most contemporary war movies made in the last decade or so have tended to downplay the action and machismo, preferring to focus on the psychological impact of combat on military personnel. But Clint Eastwood's 2015 drama American Sniper, based on the memoir of the highly decorated Navy SEAL sniper Chris Kyle, goes even further. In this movie, Eastwood and his team fudge the details here and there to come up with scenes that are somehow even more harrowing than the events from Kyle's real life. The film opens with Kyle keeping watch over a street in Iraq where a marine convoy is about to pass through. He spots a woman hand off a massive anti-tank grenade to a little boy who goes running at the convoy. Kyle has no choice but to take the kid out. In his memoir, however, Kyle makes no mention of a child, only a woman holding what was likely a much smaller, less destructive grenade. Then there's the de facto villain of the film, an Iraqi sharpshooter named Mustafa, who engages Kyle in a dramatic final showdown. But Kyle only mentions Mustafa in one paragraph of his book, saying he never saw him personally and admits that other snipers later killed the man they thought was him. The 2019 film Rocket Man utilizes Elton John's vast catalog of songs to tell the story of his rise to fame, his wildest successes, and his darkest struggles with addiction and depression. As such, it's also mostly happy to forget the nitty-gritty and focus on the drama. Do you know how disappointing it is to be your mother? During the movie, John is shown writing and recording songs in completely different years to when he actually wrote them, so as to emphasize the movie's dramatic beats. For example, he records Don't Go Breaking My Heart, a number one hit in 1976, and then plays a legendary show at Dodger Stadium, which actually happened in 1975. Not long after, he's recording the 1979 album Victim of Love while wearing the sequined hat he rocked in the late 80s. While making that LP, he decides to marry sound engineer Renata Blau, which didn't actually happen until 1984. And when John finally gets sober around 1990, the revitalized performer goes off and writes I'm Still Standing, a song that came out in 1983, when the real John was still very much addicted to his vices. Leonardo DiCaprio won an Oscar for his performance as Hugh Glass in The Revenant, who in 1823 was left for dead by fur trappers after a brutal grizzly bear attack. As Glass struggles to regain his wits and health, the film slowly turns into a tale of vengeance, with the protagonist setting out to kill John Fitzgerald, the man responsible for the death of his son. In the movie, the two foes have a climactic showdown that ends in Fitzgerald's death from a scalping. In real life, however, Fitzgerald didn't die in this manner. In 1824, he enlisted in the army and served for five years. While he was stationed at Fort Atkinson, Glass did run into Fitzgerald, but nobody ended up dead. Glass also presumably ends up dying at the end of the film in 1823, but in reality, he recovered from his bear attack and returned to work in the fur industry. He actually died a decade later in 1833. Argo is about the making of a movie that doesn't exist. 
This Oscar-winning film tells the story of how the CIA extracted six American diplomats held hostage in Iran in 1979 by staging their own fake movie production. Pulling from the memoir of CIA agent Tony Mendez and a Wired article by Joshua Behrman, the film paints the CIA in a purely heroic light. But getting those diplomats out of Iran was almost entirely the doing of Canadian government operatives, so much so that until the release of Argo, this moment in history was known as the Canadian Caper. After the events actually went down 40 years ago, Canada ironically received full credit, while American involvement was actually downplayed so as to protect the CIA from reprisal. The Americans in Argo are housed in Iran by Canadian Ambassador Ken Taylor. In reality, they were protected by a Canadian embassy worker named John Sheardown, who doesn't even appear in the film. But it was Taylor who helped hatch the final escape plan, while other Canadian government officials scouted Iranian airports and secured exit visas. Even Jimmy Carter, President of the United States at the time, gave all respect to Canada. The only thing I would say was that 90% of the contributions to the ideas and the consummation of the plan was Canadian. At first glance, Saving Mr. Banks is about the Walt Disney Company's attempts to turn P.L. Travers' Mary Poppins books into a big-screen movie musical. In the movie, Travers is extremely reluctant to let anybody touch her beloved work because her first Mary Poppins tale is really about Travers finding peace with the memory of her alcoholic father. Thanks to the kind but relentless persuasion of Walt Disney himself, the author relents and the 1964 film Mary Poppins goes into production. Saving Mr. Banks has Travers attend the film's star-studded public premiere, where she subsequently sobs her way through the screening, wrapped up in a sense of total catharsis. And while the real Travers may have cried during the screening, it was for a much different reason. Valerie Lawson, author of Mary Poppins' She Wrote, The Life of P.L. Travers, writes, It was such a shock, that name on the screen, Mary Poppins. So sudden. It hardly mattered then that her name was in such small type, listed as a consultant at first, then in the line based on the stories by P.L. Travers. By all accounts, Travers was tremendously upset with the way Disney had handled her story. But that was never going to come up in Saving Mr. Banks, a movie made by… well, you can probably guess. The makers of the Texas-set Dallas Buyers Club cast actual Texan Matthew McConaughey in the role that would elevate his career and change his life. McConaughey won an Academy Award for his portrayal of Ron Woodruff, the rodeo-riding, hard-partying, promiscuous macho man who tests positive for HIV in the 1980s. Unable to get into a clinical trial for a promising drug called AZT, Woodruff starts an operation to smuggle these experimental and possibly life-saving HIV and AIDS drugs into his community. While Woodruff was apparently a colorful character who really did bring new medicines to a lot of people, Many elements of Dallas Buyers Club are movie-building fantasy created by screenwriters to provide a narrative arc and emphasize certain aspects of Woodruff's character. In reality, Woodruff's doctor was a man named Stephen Pounders, not a woman named Eve Sachs. She's there to be somebody with whom Woodruff can flirt, reaffirming the idea that he's aggressively straight. That's an important distinction to make because in the 1980s, HIV and AIDS were still largely associated only with gay men. To that end, Woodruff takes on certain homophobic qualities, but he ditches that attitude by the end of the movie through his friendship with a transgender woman named Rayon. But like Eve Sachs, Rayon wasn't a real person either. Captain Phillips tells the absolutely terrifying tale of Captain Richard Phillips, a man who, in 2009, accidentally steered his cargo ship into pirate-controlled waters off the coast of Africa. In the end, Phillips rises up and heroically ensures the survival of his own crew. But according to some of those same crew members, the depiction of Phillips as a hero is entirely false. One crew member anonymously told the New York Post, Phillips wasn't the big leader like he is in the movie. Following the hijacking ordeal, 11 members of the crew sued Maersk Line and the Waterman Steamship Corporation over what they called the willful, wanton, and conscious disregard for their safety committed by Phillips. Various crew members actually pleaded with Phillips to not get so close to the coast of Somali where pirates were known to thrive. Deborah Waters, the crew's attorney, said he told them he wouldn't let pirates scare him or force him to sail away from the coast. Phillips was also alleged to have completely disregarded the anti-piracy protocol plans that had been written up for him. The anonymous crew member said he didn't want anything to do with it because it wasn't his plan. He was real arrogant. 
Green Book tells the story of the friendship that developed between African-American pianist Dr. Don Shirley and his Italian-American driver Tony Vallelonga on a concert tour through the segregated South in 1962. Screenwriter Nick Vallelonga based his script on anecdotes of the trip told by his father, with little to no input from Shirley's family. But Shirley's brother Maurice went so far as to call Green Book, quote, a symphony of lies. There are indeed historical errors in the movie. The exact locations and dates of the film's events were radically altered, with the real trip lasting over a year and not, as the film suggests, two months. Nor was Dr. Shirley estranged from his only brother. The real musician had three brothers with whom he spoke regularly. In one sequence, a racially charged argument with a policeman in Mississippi leads to physical violence and Tony and Dr. Shirley are jailed. They're released when Dr. Shirley places a call to a powerful friend, U.S. Attorney General Robert Kennedy. According to Dr. Shirley, the corresponding real-life event went down in West Virginia, where a policeman stopped the duo for going 35 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour zone. There were no fisticuffs and only Vallelonga was arrested. Dr. Shirley didn't have enough cash on hand to post bail, so instead of getting some money wired, he called Kennedy. Sometimes real life is so absurd that filmmakers can't help but tell the events as a comedy. And that's exactly what happened when Spike Lee co-wrote and directed Black Klansman. It's based on the memoir Black Klansman, written by retired Colorado police officer Ron Stallworth, an African-American man who managed to infiltrate and expose local operations of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1970s. God bless white America. Stallworth would deal with KKK personnel on the phone while a white law enforcement colleague attended in-person meetings and events. That's all real, although Flip Zimmerman, the white detective portrayed in Black Klansman by Adam Driver, is an invention. In his memoir, Stallworth gave the policeman the fake name of Chuck. Also made up was the movie's main love interest. Stallworth didn't date a politically active woman named Patrice during the time of his involvement with the KKK. During his investigation, Stallworth also becomes something of a mentee to National Klan leader David Duke. Later in the film, Stallworth exposes and humiliates Duke by telling him he's been duped by an African-American man. In real life, however, Duke didn't know that Stallworth wasn't who he said he was until 2006. Of course, in a way, that's actually way more embarrassing for him. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more grunge videos about your favorite movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.